Good evening everyone, this is Shane Gebauer, I'm the General Manager with Brushy Mountain Bee Farm. I'd like to welcome you uh, this evening to our webinar with Larry Connor, uh, talking about overwintering newts. Uh, I'd like to welcome Larry back. He, uh, <laughs> while we were waiting for the 6 o'clock hour to roll around, we were commenting about how uh, you make statements and you sort of end up in these sorts of positions here where where you make a comment and uh, you end up doing a webinar here for the bee farm on a on a Tuesday evening. So I'd like to thank you and and welcome you back, Larry. Uh, the last time you were here, you were talking about uh, doing some small scale queen rearing, and so this really sort of uh, ties in nicely with that because, of course, uh, if you're going to make splits, if you're going to get some nukes, you either you need to stock those nukes with uh, with a queen somehow, and either you've got to raise your own or buy them in and and so it really does tie in nicely with that. And uh, I'd just like, again, to say thank you so much for taking some time out of your, uh, your very busy schedule. I know you travel tremendously, um, and uh, your time is, is limited. And so I'd like to thank you, you for... You, you've blown enough smoke. That's okay. You, you're okay now. <laughs> Well, let me let me just blow just a little bit more smoke by by giving you a uh, the shameless plug um, because since you are coming here and taking your time, uh, I feel I have to do at least that. Larry is uh, the author of of several books, all of which are are wonderful books and and t again tie in nicely with this evening's uh, conversation. He's got um, Queen Rear uh, what. Uh, B sex, which is the one, uh, increase essentials, um, and then uh, what? What's the queen rearing essentials? Is is the most recent. So all of those really uh, tie in very very nicely with the conversation this evening. So if you don't have Larry's books, they're inexpensive, which is nice. Uh, they're they're fairly easy reads, but uh, chock full of information and wonderful illustrations and photos. So. Um, I'll, I'll give you that shameless plug. I notice you're not cutting me off on that smoke that I'm blowing there, but uh, anyway, Larry. That smells, that smells good. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, so let me, um, we have just one quick poll question here that we'd like to launch uh, uh, with folks just so that, um, so that uh, we kind of have a sense of where people are coming from and uh, to sort of help guide the conversation this evening. So I'm just going to go ahead and launch this this poll question here and if you could just take a moment to respond um, are you in the process of making a summer split for for overwintering so are you in the process of making a split basically that uh, that you hope to to overwinter now now Larry was quite clear with me when I I wrote this question that he wasn't really interested in sort of the plan to do so but you're actually somehow in in the in the process here somewhere along the process of making a, uh, a split for overwintering. And I've got a little over... The doers, not the talkers. That's right. That's right. Um, so I've got just uh, almost 90% voting in, so I'll close the poll in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Last chance. Get your votes in. Closing that poll. Let me just go ahead and share with you the results. So we've got... It's almost... 50-50. Uh, I don't know if you can see those results or not, Larry, but we've got uh, about we've got 47 percent that are saying yes and 53 percent that are saying no. So it's it's fairly close down the middle. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to uh, respond to that. Let me hide the results there. And at this point, uh, Larry, I'm going to turn it over to you. Sounds good. I appreciate your help and work and giving up uh, early evening. Uh, I guess the 6 o'clock time slot's uh, good for you because it ends the day and then you get to go home. Is that right? I, I get to go home and I can make it home in time to uh, to tuck the kids into bed. That's a good plan. All righty. All right. Well, you know, I guess uh, like any uh, good uh, talk, we've got to ask questions before we answer them. And so, you know, why do we want to overwinter a new? And this... Uh, as Shane has sort of said with the uh, the books I do and the things I write, and I also write for the American Bee Journal and Bee Culture, and been doing a lot on local stock and other things. And uh, whether you call them survivor stocks or uh, uh, bees that have bred for resistance, a lot of people are interested in using 
uh, queens that uh, have some genetic information that's good and beneficial. So here's a lovely looking queen. And uh, she's a sunbelt queen and looks good. She's got a nice, uh, a lot of brood there. But when you look at the brood, you say, oh my goodness, what's going on here? And I'm not, not meaning to pick on this particular queen, but she ran into my high tool soon after this. This is a European fall brood or something that looks an awful lot like it. And uh, when we got rid of the queen, we got rid of the disease. And now, I'm not saying the queen brought the disease in, but when you get two out of 15 queens that come in in packages that look like this, it makes me sort of suspicious that there may be a, a lack of resistance. And that's what we're trying to get rid of. We want to try to get bees that are healthier and uh, do better in our own operations. Uh, second thing is a break in a brood cycle. And those of you that have had the battle with varroa mites, you know that this is one of the things that you can do that doesn't involve a chemical. You create a break in the brood cycle. And here's a, we'll talk about this colony in a few minutes. But uh, here's a, an A-frame hive. And it's a brand new uh, swarm. And it's got a brood. But I've put the brood up above a queen excluder. You can see that metal strip there. And so we're going to make a nuke out of this. And this is going to create a break in that brood cycle for the new colony, not the old colony. The old colony still has its queen. But we're trying to create a break. So rather than that continuous production of brood, it also gives us a chance to look at the brood pattern and you know, can do some tweaking that way. I think a lot of people are motivated by money. Who isn't? Um, and noticing the packages and nukes are going up in price when you go to buy them. Uh, I think that uh, here's a uh, decent way that you can increase your own colony holdings, whether you winter them or you make them out in the summer. Making up splits is a way of uh, growing your operation. And <clears throat> with honey prices uh, at the retail level going up, I don't know if they're doing much on the wholesale level. I haven't looked lately. Uh, but at the retail level, I see some big prices on honey. Uh, I think this is something that we really want to look at. And finally, of course, getting back to the whole thing is we want to we want more colonies. We want to have a new colony. Here's a nuke I made up last week, so I can answer yes to my own question. Am I actively in the process of uh, making a nuke? So here's a, fi a five-frame colony. This is actually back in uh, March. Well, it's only got four frames in it, but we're not going to explain that right now. And uh, in, in, in the general world, you know, if you want a winner in eight frame equipment, so I know that uh, a lot of people are going to eight frames uh, because of the weight, 20% lighter than the, the 10 frame equipment. And yet the bees seem to do just as well, if, and some people say even better. And I'm experimenting with both uh, 10 frame, eight frame, and then 10 frame mediums. Uh, no opinions yet. I'm just playing around seeing what's going on. So we're going to get back to this side in a little bit because it's in my backyard. Uh, here's, here's the kind of thing that I want to share with you. This is the, a beehive that belongs to one of my students, actually two students, husband and wife, uh, Joe and Nancy. And uh, they uh, made up nukes last year with their colonies that we had in the class. And they got them through the winter. And uh, they're real pleased with what they've got. Uh, as a matter of fact, I suspect maybe this nuke has already swarmed more than once because they weren't right on top of it. But they made it up last year, wintered fine, held queens. They've had this colony uh, on hand for a replacement queen, I believe, when one of their queens has a problem. And now they're gifting this nuke. They're giving the, uh, Nancy's uh, co-worker, uh, getting him started in beekeeping. And so they, they're gifting the, the nuke. And, moving those frames into their own equipment. And I expect that uh, Joe and Nancy will be uh, making a new split uh, not too far in the future. So this is kind of the way I like to see it, keeping nukes on hand year round, having them available so you can use them in different ways. Uh, this is the inside of the nuke that we looked at a couple of weeks ago, not even that, maybe 10 days ago. It looks pretty good. And um, so it was a nice gift. Well, some of you have probably read this uh, book by GM Doolittle called A Year in the Out Apiary. And uh, this isn't a new book. This is one that I reprinted through Whitlock's Press. And uh, Doolittle was a, an upstate New York beekeeper and a writer for the journals. 
and kind of a role model for me in sense of uh, you know the gentleman beekeeper bee breeder writer whatever you might want to say I don't think he had a background in science but certainly had a scientific approach to the way he thought and um, so I recommend both of his books, A Year in the Out Apiary and uh, Scientific Queen Marine. And he's a man who's better known for developing the, the current method we call grafting. He never called it that, but the grafting method for raising queens. Doolittle talked about a simple way of making increase. And that's what's happened here. You've got a, you've got a nice little colony. This isn't a huge colony. This is actually this is a gift colony from my friend Sheldon. Sheldon brought in a swarm. Some, some friends bring cookies and candy and a bottle of beer. Sheldon brings a swarm. So what's wrong with that, right? And uh, so we put it in, and it was an after swarm from a stump he has in his backyard. He's got this bee tree that somehow he ended up with a stump of the tree, and he keeps swarming. He catches the swarms. And I was sort of interested in getting some of the genetics from this and having it on hand. Then I was thinking about Doodle's method of, of making an increase. So Doodle simply took frames of brood from the uh, lower box and put it in the upper box. And if he couldn't find the queen, he simply shook the bees back into the bottom of the box or at the entrance. So if the queen was there, she'd go back below the queen excluded. This is important. So you've got a, an area above the bees that doesn't have the queen. And then, of course, by putting brood up there, we'll show you that in just a minute, uh, the bees are going to, the nurse bees are going to go up. I've been playing around this with this idea for a, a month or so. And the idea that I like is that, okay, we have a nectar flow on here this year. We didn't last year. So it's really cool to have nectar coming into the hives. And you put empty equipment on and you come back and say, oh, they're working on it. They're, they're drawing out that foundation. And since I've only, in, in the second year of my current phase of beekeeping, I'm having fun with uh, just the whole process of building an operation. So I always seed, without the queen excluder, when I put the second box on there, I always seed the uh, second box with a frame or two of, of honey. Uh, Dr. Dewey Caron, who was at the uh, University of Delaware, and now out in Oregon, and he's coordinating the WAS meeting, the Western Agriculture Society meeting this year. Dewey always says, you have to kind of tell bees what you want. So here was my message to the bees. I want you to uh, go up there and work on that second box and, and get involved there. Well, because there's no queen excluder, excluder, or because there is a queen excluder, the queen can't get up there, I then took a queen who's not there. She's, she's gone. She had, uh, even Larry makes mistakes. They forgot to put the candy plug on there. So she got out. So she's running around in that upper box. Now, it's not a lot of bees, but we've got a frame of honey here. You can see the cursor. I don't know if you can see that chain or not. And down here, and two frames of brood. Though I'm not terribly worried about the strength because there are nighttime temperatures that have been in the high 60s, low 70s. Our daytime highs have been in the 80s, 90s. And I don't think we've hit 100 yet. They're close. And so we're not worried about the weather. The big concern I always had was making up a new two things, enough bees and enough food. So here's one of the frames of brood that I used. And same one I showed you earlier to show you the, the break of the brood pattern. And what you actually have here is an area of sealed brood, but you have an area of open brood where the bees are emerging. So I intentionally picked that frame. And there's another frame down here in the box. Uh, you can kind of see the brood pattern there. And they're going to go into the five-frame nuke box. But on either side of the, these two frames, here and on here, there's a frame with honey on it. And all of those are going to be transferred into the five-frame nuke. So here's that brand new sheet of foundation, uh, plastic foundation. And the bees have been on there for maybe seven to ten days. That's that kind of nectar flow. And I always like to use a good nectar flow to build out comb because you don't get them every year, right? So <laughs> here's uh, uh, food for the bees and probably some uh, older bees as well, not just nurse bees, but some field bees and bees in the process of making beeswax. And here's a screen of five-frame nuke box. 
And we I moved all those frames in. So you've got two frames of brood and the bees on it, and a frame of honey on it here, and a frame of honey. And so the number one and number four position is well. And then a fifth frame just to fill out the box, and that's foundation. So it's it's small thing, and I, you know, I'm doing all this at home, and it seems like every time I do something, uh, I say, well, everything I've got is at the farm, at the barn, at the farm, and that's nine miles away. So I didn't have an entrance reducer, and you really do want to reduce the entrance on these bees. Doodle writes about that. It'll tell you exactly what size entrance to reduce it on a ten frame line. So I just found a roll of paper towel, rolled it up, and, you know, 10 days later, it's still there. We haven't had that much rain, unfortunately, but it stayed intact. And that's helping to keep robbers out and so forth. So here are my two hives. The parent hive on the right, the, 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 the daughter hive, if you will, uh, on the left, toward the bottom. And now it's my summer increase. So many of you with, you know, one or two colonies, hopefully you'll have the, the courage to go out there and, and make these up. And then it, just to continue the whole cycle, I simply uh, found another frame of honey down below and brought that up to the second box and set it here. So the queen's down below, the original queen, Sheldon's uh, swarm queen, uh, that we hope has all kind of genetics that we want. And I can tell you, she looks good. She's laying a, a heck of a brood pattern, and she's done a nice job of producing bees that want to produce honey. And uh, so I'm seeding the, seeding that top box again, and then filling it out with uh, both the uh, the plastic in the frames and plastic uh, comb. So that's that's what's going on in that. And uh, um, Shane, I don't know if I should ask for questions at this point because I am going to make a break from this particular system. Well, so if, uh, you, if you want to let we, people, you know send in any questions on what I've said so far. This might be a good time to take a break. Well, we just, <laughs> we just got a couple there. Um, I do want to just comment, Larry, that we've had a couple people um, um, that are having just a little bit of a difficult time hearing. Um, but uh, I, I think for the most part, everyone's okay. But there have been some that are, have said that it's rather uh, a, little, a little soft. So if you could, um, I'm not sure if you can adjust your, your mic a little bit. But... Um, that's one thing. Now let me, uh, we did have a question that um, is sort of uh, uh, related to everything you've just been discussing, which is, what's the latest month of the year? And this person happens to be in Connecticut, an area that you're fairly familiar with, um, that uh, you can make up a nuke and expect a, to, uh, to have overwintering success. Well, I think you can probably get away with it in Connecticut uh, uh, most any time in August. And if you're in an area that gets uh, an early September flow, and it's probably your nectar flow you've got to be more concerned about. But the later you go, the more feeding you'll probably have to do. So I think after the, maybe the 10th or so of uh, September in Connecticut, you probably want to uh, cut it off. Now, just a few miles north in Massachusetts and Vermont and so forth, you may have to cut it off a full month earlier than that. It depends on what you've got coming in and how the bees are doing. And, and and what about uh, what about if the other extreme? Uh, this person happens to be in Georgia. Well, I haven't kept bees in Georgia on a regular basis, so I would suggest they do the same thing. If they've got a fall flow, uh, maybe they can tell you when their flow ends in the fall. If they don't have a fall flow, it makes it a lot more interesting because uh, you're going to have to do a lot of feeding without having nectar coming in. Um, the other thing is that if you have good pollen coming in in the fall in any location, then you can supplement with sugar syrup and feed, and the pollen can then be used as the protein. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that I've become a real strong advocate for fall feeding of the protein. Um, I don't see that much variation in the different uh, patties that you can buy on the market, and, and I don't want to step on your toes, Shane, in terms of you know, what you sell and what you don't sell. I've used uh, three different manufacturers, and the biggest difference I see is how gooey they get. Uh, some get real gooey, some uh, don't. And I don't like to work a hive when I'm, everything's sticking to me, so that's probably a, a minor complaint. But the protein patties in the fall is a good way of uh, getting these colonies up, and if uh, people have read or, or heard anything about what they call fat 
bee, the skinny bee, those fall bees, you want them well fed. They actually have nutrients, uh, enzymes, and uh, all kinds of uh, various uh, physical components in their body that help them get through the winter and also raise that first cycle of brood. So that's probably how I would make the call. And Georgia's a big state. It's like talking to a Texas, bee, Texas beekeeper. Uh, you better find out where they are because they're in South Texas. They're going to have a whole different situation than North Texas. Same thing in Georgia. So where you are in Georgia would make a big difference. All right. We've got uh, a couple of questions about um, um, the source of the queen that, for the nuke. And I suspect that uh, th that we're just sort of either acquiring one from a queen breeder or, or perhaps from uh, our, our small-scale queen operation that we've got in the backyard. Is, is that is that yeah, great? You know, this, this is hopefully the segue that we've got is that people are now raising a few queens. They read my book, and now they've got a few queens coming off. Um, we're raising queens this year, and so that's where the queens in the plastic cage come from. And uh, so I think the number on that was number 26, which means it was graft 26. So uh, we've been fairly busy this year grafting. Um, and we're grafting from colonies that uh, originally went back to the Purdue program that Greg Hunt has, uh, Dr. Greg Hunt, and then they have been uh, naturally mated. And we bought nukes last year, so they're second-year queens, and we're grafting from them. But we've also tried to bring in stock from Sheldon's uh, Swarm Hive. Uh, we've got uh, uh, two queens from Mike Palmer in Vermont, uh, northern Vermont. So we're trying to bring different things in. But the whole idea is, uh, and I think that's a good role model for people to use, just bring in stocks from different areas and try them. Until you try them, you don't know how they're going to work out. Uh, I would not NOT buy Queens from a Sunbelt state for wintering in a northern state. If, you're in, you're, if you live in a Sunbelt state, those are the Queens you want. It's always fun to go to California or someplace and say, well, we just drive around the street and pick up a Queen from, you know, a major Queen producer. And that's great if you can do it, but if you're not in California, that won't work. Okay. What's that? Do you have anything else? Oh, well, there's a lot of questions. I don't know uh, how far we want to go along with this. I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on here. Okay, I'll I'll, ta I'll table these for uh, for a little bit later. Okay. Uh, some of you may have uh, read the article I wrote about Joe Latshaw about the polystyrene hives that he tested last year. Uh, that's the winter of uh, 09 to 10, and these are some of his uh, uh, nuke boxes. These are five frame nuke boxes. Made in Canada. I was just, just up in Canada visiting with uh, Medhat Nasser. And, uh, they use a lot of these in Canada. And uh, you can buy them with the uh, kind of knockdown version, which is what this is. And if you think of it as a beer cooler, uh, it's, it's one piece except with a lid. And it, uh, it has some real advantages. Joe found that he was able to get 20, or, excuse me, 33 out of 36 of his five-frame nukes through the winter. Then they varied in their strength, but I went to his website, and this is a photo from the website, and this is uh, uh, near Columbus, Ohio, just set out in, in rows, no insulation or anything, but these are all five-frame nukes, and uh, you see he's got them painted, uh, pointed in different directions. The lower hole is the flight hole, the upper hole is for ventilation. Now, it's interesting that the Alberta beekeeper said if they do that, that Alberta clipper comes through and blows cold air right through from one direction to the other, and it'll kill the hives. So if you situate these in a windy location, uh, you may want to block off the, the screen hole, not the entrance holes, but the screen hole. But here's one of his slides of what the bees look like back in March or April. So it's, uh, it's an encouraging thing. And... Uh, in my case, with you know, wooden boxes, do I want to buy some of these and transfer them in? I, I think that uh, there's some real advantages we want to look at. Now, the other advantage that I see with these polystyrene hives is that the bottom of this hive also serves as a feeder. So you can put about a liter of uh, sugar syrup into these colonies, and they simply take and pour... Uh, they have a, a hose that goes right in here and put about a 
milliliter uh, support of uh, sugar syrup. And they can do it late in the season, early in the season. They can put hot syrup in there to uh, kind of break up the cluster, and the bees will come down in the combs and feed on it. So here's something that I think a lot of us need to play with and, and get some, and some feedback on. Now, uh, again, another way to winter bees in, in a nuke-type format, in other words, not a big, booming, full-size colony, here is uh, a swarm from last year that we caught. And um, on March 7th, we opened it up, and uh, we've got a, uh, a cloth there. We were experimenting with a uh, feed bag for venting away some moisture, and that worked about 80% of the time. 20% was still at condensation. So I'm looking, I'm looking at landscape fabric for this year. But here's the swarm. You see they didn't even finish building out the colony. But the big difference is that we fed. And we had sugar syrup that we were feeding in the division board feeder and then the, uh, the protein patty. And this is now one of our breeders that we're producing queens from. And it's done very well. It's produced some money. And uh, so I'm really encouraged by, you know, just wintering in this, these smaller units uh, so that uh, uh, you've got a, a minimum investment, if you will, in equipment in time. Uh, well, there's always time going into bees, but it's, it's a good way for you to, to do some of these things. Uh, so 5 frame, 8 frame, 10 frame, they all work out pretty well. Well, here's one of the nukes we had that made it through. Not all of them did make it through last year. We had a horrible year last year and in Michigan, and uh, I know some people have had really hot temperatures. So we're on a nectar flow, and... You know, it's about time. But this is March 31st on the farm, uh, which is just, just between Battle Creek and Kalamazoo. And so there are only four frames here, so we're going to look at both sides. So this is the outside frame. And if you turn it around, you can see you've got bees that are working on that honey and storing some pollen. So go to the second frame, and you've got brood. There's the, the sealed brood right here, and the honey's over here. A little bit of honey over there, and there's, of course, going to be pollen around it. Turn that frame around, and you see that, you know, it's uh, through the mirror image, if you will, the honey's that consist consistently at the, the other end toward the entrance of the hive. More pollen and more brood. And the maples at this point have been in bloom for about two weeks, which was actually about two weeks early this year. I normally figure this would be a the end of March is when the maples would be in bloom in this particular area. Well, you know, I'm freely, freely willing to admit that we have our whoops moments. Here's a medium frame that somehow got into 10 frame equipment. Probably had brood down here when we put it in there and we wanted to, all that brood, we didn't want to cut it out and waste it, so uh, we didn't. And, but you can see now in the third frame that you've got it. There's the queen. She's marked in green ink, so uh, green paint. So you know that was an 09 queen. And um, so she's going to work here. But this is uh, the end of March. Now, this colony now is in about five boxes. It's already produced two boxes of honey. So uh, and now I'm in the process of making more. So I'm encouraged by this whole idea. Not all of them make it, but the ones that make it, uh, I, I'm, I'm pleased with what we're seeing. So, that's pretty much what I had planned on saying, Jay, in terms of the uh, content. And here's my contact information. The best way to get a hold of me, uh, as I tell everybody nowadays, is on the Internet. It's L.J. Connor, not uh, L.I. And it's O-R, not E-R. Uh, Shane will appreciate this. I just had an order go astray because somebody spelled that email address wrong. So I don't mean to be a, a nut about spelling. It's just that it's important to put email. So let's throw it open to questions. Okay, um, we've got we've got several questions, uh, sort of relating to feeding and dearths, and um, basically ensuring that um, you've got uh, enough food, basically, in a five-frame nuke. To overwinter and and how do you I guess how do you go about balancing that? There's a lot of people asking that question, like what do I need? What do well, I need? You know that, How do I do it? You know these these little colonies probably require a little bit more management than a big colony because 
they can go uphill or swarm. I mean, go downhill, you know, you know, kind of peter out, starve to death, whatever you want to say, during a dearth, or two weeks of a, a really good forage, and all of a sudden you've got queen cells. And uh, that's the real challenge. So you have to, don't be too ambitious. You know, set out to maybe three or four if you just want to do this on a limited basis. Or you would say, oh, I want to do 100 of these. Well, I suggest you do no, maybe 20. And uh, spend more time per nuke. And the nice thing about these is that you can move a frame of honey from a good colony, a strong colony, to a weaker one. Uh, you can replace the queen. If you've got a queen you don't like, now is the time to get rid of it. This goes back to uh, Brother Adam who developed the buck bass bee, and he used to uh, heal the winter nukes. That's where this whole idea is kind of tracing back to, a buck fast abbey in, in England, south uh, east of England, and uh, southwestern too. And so it's, it's a nice technique for you to equalize things out, uh, look at the queen, look at her brood pattern, if it's a bad pattern because of inbreeding or disease, if you have a colony in the fall that has chalk brood or European fall brood or, for heaven's sakes, American fall brood, uh, they're out of your program. With American fall brood, you're going to have to do something with the, that equipment. So it's a way of, of culling your bees. And if you start out with 20, maybe over winter 12. Uh, that may be too severe. It may not be severe enough, depending on your point of view. But I think it's something that you can work on. And uh, as far as the feeding process, you can see we use uh, two to one sugar syrup. We use a, a heavy sugar syrup and try to build these up as much as we can. Last year, we did not have frames of honey from other colonies to add. That's certainly an option I think we'll have this year, that we could fill out the boxes uh, with frames of honey. So that if a five-frame nuke is going into winter and you've got a nice little cluster there, uh, you know, somewhere like a package of bees, you know, two to three pounds of bees uh, in that five-frame box, and you want to have four to four and a half, four to four and a half frames of honey and about a half a frame of cluster space for the bees. And that's, that's what you want uh, when you put the bees you know, to bed, if you will. Uh, the last inspection in the fall, although uh, you get a peak because you want to make sure these bees don't have problems. And you can add protein year-round if you get a break in the weather. Here in Georgia, if you get a break in the weather, and you can get a protein patty on there, or half of a patty uh, cut lengthwise so it's on, over the brood area. Don't put it in the corner because they won't be able to get to it. It's got to be right over the brood. Uh, then that works out really well. Did I answer that question? I, I, I think you did just just wonderful. Um, I, I've got a question about, you know, most of the, the slides that you showed were, you know, the, the, the nukes in the, the tree, lo, tree line there. The one that you made was, uh, was a five-frame nuke, and, and uh, the, like I said, the ones in the tree line were five-frame nukes. Um, what about, uh, and I know that uh, you mentioned Mike Palmer. I know he does this quite a bit, where he overwinters nukes on top of, uh, full-size colonies. Um, what do you think about that, and what, what sort of tips or advice might you have uh, for, for going that route if someone wanted to try that? Well, I think, I think that if you want to, uh, here are two polystyrene nukes, but if you visualize this as one box with two, two uh, uh, queens in there, each with a separate direction, opposing directions for entrances, uh, we have some of these that we've been playing with this year uh, in medium equipment. Uh, other people use deeps. I think there's a lot of advantage to that. It's something you can, um, I don't think I have anything to you know, put a soft curve through, but uh, we'll just use this one for a second. But if you were to divide this colony in half and put a, a masonite or, or in a cardboard, a uh, plywood divider in there, and then you could have two hives here. The advantage of this system that Mike Palmer and other use is that you, you basically have the heat from one colony helping the other. And Mike Palmer and uh, uh, Kurt uh, Webster, they will put these on top of colonies 
So put the plywood bottoms right on top of the uh, top of the colony, take the, the cover off, but leave the inner cover on, put, put that in, and then wrap them in northern uh, Vermont. So you've got different possibilities, and I get into that in uh, increase essentials, kind of outlining some of the different things you can do. Um, we're looking at the, the double box this year, as well as what I've shown you. I actually left them out on purpose, kind of confused you know I wish I put them in. Never know, do you? Um, <clears throat> would you, uh, we're going back to, to Queens a little bit and sort of the source of the Queen for the nuke. Um, what about uh, basically just, just pulling some frames of brood out that, that maybe have some, uh, some eggs and some real young larvae uh, and just letting them raise out their own? Would you do that? No. What I do uh, do is that I'll take uh, uh, set Queens House that the bees have raised themselves in a healthy colony, uh, swarm cells and supersedure cells. And I'm going to look for big cells. I'll cut out anything that looks kind of smallish. And let those queens take over the hive, uh, especially these five-frame nukes. Uh, sometimes you see some queen cells and say, boy, I hate to destroy those. But for one reason or another, you know you need to. So you pull a frame out and you put them into a nuke, and that's a good way of doing it. My reasoning for reason for saying no to letting them raise their own queens from eggs and larvae, two, two things. One, it takes a long time. It's a long time before that egg develops as a queen, mates, produces brood, and that brood emerges. It's got a long time period uh, for a, a cycle, a complete cycle from egg to, to uh, mature worker bees. The other reason is that if you mess up and you don't have a real strong colony there, the bees all drift back to the parent hive, then um, you may get a really small queen, poorly reared queen, and all the evidence is that uh, those queens just don't do as well. So uh, I'm going to say no to that, but use, play with your queen cells, because most beekeepers do see queen cells from time to time, and I, I I tell my students is that they just gave you permission to to do something when you see a queen cell, so have fun with it. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention that I didn't talk about with these five frame nukes is that when you have a number of them in an operation, um, just swap them around to equalize the strength. So if one is quite strong with a lot of bees and another one's weak, just reverse their positions, and that'll be a good way of uh, equalizing the population because the bees will go back to the location, not the equipment, and uh, strengthen the colony that, that's weak and maybe keep that uh, stronger colony from uh, raising queen cells. Next question? Um, I, I think I'd, I'd just like to comment on raising out the own, their, own, uh, their own queen that, that uh, it was actually, and I think I mentioned this last time we talked about queen rearing with you, Larry, is that uh, it was at Sneba, which is... Uh, um, Southern New, what, it, what is it? Southern New England Beekeepers uh, Assembly. Assembly, which is a conference held in. We didn't want, to have another, we didn't want any more BS in the bee world. <laughs> so, but they have a conference every year in Connecticut, and and you're very much involved with that. And I remember hearing Dave Tarpey speak at that, and his comments about. Uh, uh, basically, emergency queen cells, which is what it is if they just if you make a split like that and raise up, and if they raise out their own queen, okay. and uh, and of course we know that uh, the the larvae that they can use for raising queens are larvae that are one to three days old. But we also know that the ones at three days old uh, really, as you mentioned, don't really produce the best queens. But yet those will be the first ones to emerge, and they'll go around and bump off all those other cells before they have an opportunity to emerge. So what you're actually doing is selecting for potentially uh, an inferior queen uh, as if you were to do that. So, so I think you're right. Going with cells is, is a great way to go, uh, especially if they're... Well, the, other, the, other, the other thing about the queen cells, so soon is the fact that you're uh, uh, like a, a swarm cell. Uh, the queen uh, lays the egg into this, the cup. So that larvae 
that egg larvae pupae and then the queen it's always been a queen bee and i know it's a, it's a, it's a, probably not a very important distinction but the fact that you're you're not going from i mean compare that to the emergency environment where oh we need a queen quick turn somebody into a queen here feed them this um, which is what the bees are basically doing here you've got a situation where the uh, Bees have always wanted that particular larvae to be the queen or a queen, and so uh, I think their feeding is different. I think their their temperature management. They're all probably dozens of different things that are different with those queens. So you just get a better queen that way. Uh, I really like swarm queens. I think they're good. Um, yeah, if you don't like swarming behavior, you're going to have to work a little bit harder to cut cells out and manage them. But we want to make increase. So right now. Globally, I think we need more bees. So this, this is Mother Nature's answer. Let them swarm. All right. Um, more bees. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, this is a, a question that I hear uh, quite frequently. I think probably more so in the south because of uh, dearths that we have tend to be a little bit more prolonged and, and uh, severe than uh, up in the north. Um, and, and it, it's regarding robbing. How do you keep uh, a nuke, which is a weak colony, um, but yet you may be feeding uh, a patty, you may be putting syrup in it. How do you prevent it from being robbed out? Now, I see, yeah, I, I kind of figured you would go back to this slide with the, uh, the towel there, but um, even, even with a reduced entrance, it can be really, really difficult do to... Uh, do not do it. Yeah, so, so what's, what's the trick? That if you're in an area, for example, we just had a full-size hive up here that get that uh, little robbing frenzy started out today because we had a feeder on it and the upper entrance was accidentally left open. And boy, every bee around here found that upper entrance, and and it was a real it was a real nightmare. So once it starts, yeah. really hard. To once you start, the then those bees know how to rob. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, dedicated to a life of crime, if you will, it, biological crime. Exactly. All right. What do we do? Here's, 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 here's what I would suggest. First of all, this rolled out paper towel is, you know, a quick and dirty answer. And some people will reduce this entrance down to one bee size. And the problem with that, with a piece of wood, the problem with that is, you know, when it's 95 degrees out, that box gets toasty warm inside. And I don't have a ventilation hole on this particular hive, which is probably something that I should have done. And short of being out there with the drill, putting holes and putting screens on it, I think people need to look at uh, the, the robbing screen that uh, Dr. Harry Laidlaw uh, wrote about, and it's in his book that, that I published. But no, I still have copies, but it's no longer uh, being reprinted, uh, Queen Ring and Bee Breeding. And he talks about a robbing screen. And a robbing screen is nothing more than a little wooden uh, frame with window screen on it or hardware cloth. And so it provides ventilation for the entire uh, opening. So you can take this darn uh, paper towel off. But in the corner, you have a hole big enough for one worker bee to go in and out. And that's on the side. And so you can, in, I think of bees, beehives as having input and output and their their exhaust is what bumblebees and other colonies are smelling they, they're attracted to the, the smell of the hive so the bees are flying in and out based on that so if you put a screen on this on a frame and then you have a little tiny hole over here or over here that the bees are actually using as an entrance then remember this is a small colony so now with the robin screen you're going to be able to reduce the number of bees that can get in at one time. So the guard bees, and you know, I figured that at this point it's Harry, Mo, and Larry that are, you know, you know guarding the, the entrance. There aren't that many bees around, so they've got, you know, some rude recruits here that are guarding the entrance, and they'll be able to handle it with one bee coming in and out at a time, instead of having this big gaping hole here that I've got. Have you used one, Shane? You guys ought to make them. That's something that every bee supply company should make. Well, give them a, 
I'm really having a hard time with you tonight, Larry, because you got all this stuff that we just don't have. We actually make the moving and robbing screen for 8 frame and 10 frame Heinz. We don't have one for a nuke, but, but you're recommending... Okay, well, you know, the robbing screen, can you modify it for the uh, 10 frame? Or the, the uh, 8 frame down to 5? Uh, we we would have we would have to manufacture one that that actually fit uh, fit onto the the nuke bottom boards that, that we've got, but uh, like I said, your recommendation is duly noted, and uh, you know we might have to look well, into that. I know that now. there are other methods of of developing robbing screens. You know, I've seen molded plastic gadgets and all kinds of things, um, but I think Harry Laidlaw's technique of a simple loose screen with the hole on the side is you know, simple and elegant. And uh, not to take business away from Brushy Mountain, but it's something a lot of people can do. I'm too totally inept at this, but um, the uh, uh, putting things together, I mean. But in terms of uh, something a lot of people can do and uh, be a, a great uh, B Club project to uh, put together these uh, robbing screens and make sure you've got them in all sizes. How's that? That that sounds that sounds great. Um, we've got uh, we're going back to feeding here, um, and and I noticed that uh, in one slide it was in I don't know whether it was an eight frame or ten frame hive. You had a division board feeder. Um, we had patties. Uh, you showed a patty on top of, of a colony. What do you what do you think about how, how best to feed liquid in a into a five frame nuke? Um, do you recommend a division board feeder? Do you recommend an, a top feeder for nukes? Um, what what would be your preferred method if you had to feed some some sugar water or corn syrup, perhaps a frame of honey? But what if what if your colonies that your your full size colonies don't have the surplus? What if you don't want to well, rob a frame of honey to give to the nuke? This is a whole motivation for my little experimenting with this new little method. Um, trying to come up with something that had uh, the, the colonies actually had some honey. I'm going to find it here uh, because normally, if you make up a nuke, uh, you just say, "Oh, well, there's honey in the corners of those brood frames. That's enough." So they've got you know empty frames or sheets of foundation and two frames of brood or one frame of brood, whatever you decide. At this time of year, do at least two frames of brood, uh, three if you're doing medium or double, just because of the time of the season. So here's. Here's new column. It's, you can see that they're storing some of this. I don't know if that's brood or not. But anyway, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just say that's all nectar there. And we're trying to encourage these bees to, to have enough feed. So feeding in the column is good. Now, Boardman feeders, those are the jars that spit out in front. But I weakened this spring, and uh, my colleagues and I talked me into getting some Boardman feeders because they are easy. But I want out of three leaks. The jars leak. So now we've got to go through and make sure that the lids fit the jars and don't leak and we don't have it dripping out because the feeders create the robbing problem too. Once you get robbing at a hive and they go into the hive and, and they try to clean them out. So we've had that problem happen. Uh, I like division board feeders um, and but they take up so darn much room. And there's there's uh, you know, if you have a, some of them, if you have a five-frame nuke, the feeder takes up the space of two frames. Now you're down to three frames, and that's just not what we want to do. So you've got to find a balance of some sort here. Um, the pollen patties uh, can be made up, and if you make up your own, I don't remember which way it was. Do you have a recipe for making your own, Larry? That was another no. question since you brought it up. I don't have a recipe because my students, when they went out and bought the uh, it was Mega B and they started to make it up themselves, they, they turned into uh, uh, hockey pucks. They were so hard and horrible. So I buy the patties, but I'm wondering if, you know, I, I guess I can't buy them. There it is. Uh, these, these protein patties, you can have them made, or I guess if you make enough of them. I know the commercial beekeepers uh, that have the two-story cement mixers to make this stuff up with, uh, they increase the sugar content with their patties. So so get your KitchenAid mixer out and uh, play with recipes and make one that has more sugar in it and uh, a little less protein. 
and I think the, uh, the Mega B is actually supposedly fed in a sugar syrup. I couldn't get that to work last year and gave up on it. But um, getting away from the sugar syrup and the division board feeder, you know, one thing is to think about, can I put enough sugar in here? Now, are they going to store that? Maybe, but probably not. So if you want to get a lot of sugar syrup into a colony, I think the division board feeder by default is what you've got left. Now, there are different styles of feeders. This one has a rough side. Uh, don't take that burr comb off because that keeps the bees from drowning. Uh, the bees are able to walk up and down on this. Uh, there's some new ones out that have a wooden lock on top, and then I call them ladders, uh, tubes, or just make cylinders of uh, window screen and stuff these things with cylinders vertically so the bees can go down into the syrup and, and come back up. Because, boy, if you've got a small colony, you don't want to lose 20% of the bees to drown in, the, in this feeder. Um, top feeders, we're playing with that, and I'm not real happy about that yet. When you get another leaker, you know, they leak out the front of the hive, so that's another issue. But the advantage of a top feeder and that would be where you actually have a, uh, a plywood hive with a hole drilled in it, and the jar lid fits right in there. Two problems. One is the leaking issue. Uh, and the other one is, what do you do when the jar's not there? You've got to put a lid or a block of wood or something in there to hold that, because you don't want that to be at second entrance. The nice thing about the top feeders, as with the Borden feeders, you can tell when they need to be fed, so you can come back and replace the ones. And usually the ones that take the feed down faster are your better colonies. And that gives you some, oh, without looking, I know which one's you know, the strongest colony here because it's taking the feed down the fastest. I don't think it's obvious. I think it's, it's a behavior here, not a moral judgment. Um, we've got some people that are inquiring about candy boards and your thoughts on those. Uh, candy boards during the winter, yeah. I think that's a good idea. You see the lid here. You could modify it with a rim and put a candy board on there. That'd be great. And I know some people, uh, Kim Flottam, the bee culture, uh, the Medina County beekeepers, they go out and they buy the blocks of funded from, uh, um, well, we have Gordon Food Service here. Like somebody said Walmart sells it. It's a frosting uh, shortening mix, uh, not shortening mix, uh, uh, frosting mix that you can slice up and put on these things. Um, Another good club project if you want to mix up this stuff. The, uh, the advantage of the, the candy boards is that it doesn't involve any water, so you can be there all winter long. Put it on in the fall. Modify your, your five-frame nuke box or your, your double five-frame nuke for your, of course, with the uh, polystyrene boxes, you can have it right, put the candy right on the bottom. Take the frames out, put the candy down, put the frames back in, leave it there all winter. Or until they eat it. There, there are a couple questions that are, are somewhat related, and that, and and they 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 sort of involve the uh, management of the population of a newt. So, in other words, um, let's say perhaps you started newts uh, earlier in the season, and just in case you had a colony go queenless or laying worker or something, and so you've got these newts that you started up fairly early in the spring and uh, you haven't used them up, uh, but of course now they're really starting to bust out. Um, and then also we've got people that are, are sort of curious about why not just manage nukes all year long sort of as a hive in, in hive equipment. So how do you go about managing the population so that you can sustain these things as nukes and they're there for you to overwinter or there if you need them to, uh, to establish a dead out or, uh, or replace a queen or whatever the case may be? Well, to answer the second, the last question first, managing nukes, that's sort of the attraction of a, a an A-frame hive for me because it's smaller um, and it, it'll fit better in a lot of people's backyards. And that's another Kim Plotum idea that I kind of agree with. Which it's hard, hard for me to agree with Kim in public, but it's a good point. Uh, Five-frame nukes, I super them. They get strongly super them. And uh, you can split them off. You can make another nuke with them. You can always take bees away from a nuke and add them to a stronger, a weaker colony. Um, I don't 
care how big your operation is. It always seems like there's some colony that could use an extra frame of bees and brood. Put them in an observation lab, send the kid off to school with the observation, or take it, take it to school in the fall. But there are a lot of different things that are involved here. If we go back to that uh, swarm cell uh, story, uh, here the swarming season is primarily May, early June. And that may be early for people to make up nukes for wintering, but why not? So you've got the queen cells, you've got the brood, you've got the maximum population. A frame or two in each box you want to have for nukes. Then, like Brother Adam, you've got all season you can evaluate those queens. You could actually test them for hygienic behavior like they did at the University of Minnesota. All these different things that you could do with a five-frame nuke that you can do with a, a larger colony. And super it, with, you know, make five or ten frames of plenty. Put, I don't know if we have the equipment that would work for cut comb. You could always put uh, edible comb in there for a cut comb. That would be fine. And so the nooks could be a nice way to have a small colony tucked away in the corner of the garden and people aren't paying much attention to it. You might have the rest of your bees somewhere else to share with another beekeeper or a mentor or just uh, whoever taught you how to keep bees. Or one of your students, you know. We, we learn from students all the time nowadays. So, at least I do. I think that there are a lot of possibilities there. One of the things that we're looking at with the double five-frame nuke boxes is uh, supering them with the divider that goes into the super. And then we'll have two colonies side by side. Years ago, there was a hive that was sold. What was the name of that? The Kirkhoff hive, which basically had two colonies side by side. And uh, so it's the same kind of idea. Um, but use, this would use standard equipment, and that's the appeal I always have. I like for the standard equipment rather than getting something terribly specialized. Uh, what else? Um, we, we've got someone that uh, the slides you've got up right now, uh, someone's inquiring about, uh, you mentioned putting a, a feed sack across the top. Is that... Just, is that like a traditional burlap that maybe was a wick, or is it the sort of synthetic feed sack? What's, what's going on there? It goes back to, to Mike Palmer and uh, uh, some of the Ohio, the, excuse me, Connecticut people that were doing. They were using feed bags. These feed bags, they shredded. You can see the white things. Birds loved it in the spring. They were white bird nests in the neighborhood. Um, but the whole idea was a woven fabric that would breathe and allow the uh, uh, moisture to wick out without having compensation issue. But with, especially with the double five-frame nuke boxes, um, you want to work one half and not both, have not, not have both open at the same time. And that works really well. And that's uh, I know that for photo of that in Increase Essentials. The um, materials must be a different manufacturer in the, in the, the bags. I wasn't real happy with these. They work. They just they were just shredding everywhere. And we got to find something that's got a little different weave to it. Uh, that's just probably a, a local source thing here for us to work out. I did go out and buy some landscape fabric. I haven't tried it yet. I know some people have done that. That's an awful lot like the silt fencing that you see along highway construction that lets the water through and not the uh, the sand and gravel. So I think there are things to work with here and. Uh, I like the idea of wicking these smaller units rather than having um, too much ventilation. You want to, you know, hold the heat, get rid of the moisture. I think that's the key here. Uh, with these smaller uh, five-frame, four-frame, double nukes, whatever you got. We uh, we uh, I th I think that, and I, I I'll confess I have a hard time wrestling with this too. The, the, there's quite a few questions. Uh, sort of regarding uh, not necessarily the population of a colony, but just the, the I guess the bee dynamics, the logistics of overwintering a five frame nuke. You know, one person writes in, you know, that they've always been told uh, where where he is that you need two double deeps to overwinter a colony. And now here we are this evening, Larry, talking about overwintering a five-frame nuke. And one person's wondering, is it possible to overwinter a five-frame medium-sized nuke? So uh, what what's going on here yeah, in a, in a small yeah. colony? What, what are the dynamics that make this possible? 
Well, I think I think the, the key thing here is you've got a young queen. Um, you have uh, a colony that's been made up this season, and quite often you've got uh, new combs in there, new foundation, new, new, new everything. And you've made sure you've fed them up carefully so that they're, they're pretty much chock-a-block full of uh, honey and nectar. And uh, do all of them survive? No. Some don't survive. Some don't have good wintering ability as bees or queens carrying on the, the traits of their daughters. So we'll probably be selecting a, a, a group of uh, bees that do better in these smaller units rather than those giant jumbo two and three. I just, you know, there are beekeepers that want to have 120 pounds of honey in three deeps. Um, and that's an enormous hive to go into winter with. And it works for them because that's what they've done before. They know how to do it. So here's something that we haven't done before. When, here, here's my answer to the, the, the population dynamics. When you look at some of the bees in the wild, when I see pictures of bees coming out of the sides of buildings and bee trees, I'm always amazed at how much smaller they are than our commercial beehives. And so what's going on here? You know, did Langstroth really design the uh, Langstroth hive based on the, the, the dimensions of the champagne case? I don't know if that's true or not. Maybe something find the documentation to prove me right or wrong. But, you know, what's available tends to be what drives a lot of beekeepers' uh, decision making. I'm real curious about some of these smaller colonies so that you don't get quite the uh, early buildup in the brood uh, cycle. And, and, when, and if they do, it's a small brood pattern. So they don't go through their resources as quickly as those large colonies with 40,000 bees in January. That's, that's a lot of bees to feed. And I think that's where we succeed with these smaller nukes, is that we have more bees that are going to get through the winter because they're young and they're fat bees. They're the bees that, that will raise brood next spring using stored food and the food that's stored in their bodies as compared to old bees that have been through a honey crop and you know you see a big die off. Do you see die offs in these five frame nukes? Do you have a lot of dead bo bodies at the at the entrance or at the bottom board? Yes you do. And I don't think, see any way you could avoid that or eliminate that. But the dynamics are there. It's just a smaller unit and uh, I think it's something we need to work on. Yes I was raised on uh, you got to have at least two and better than three deep high bodies filled with honey uh, going into the winter. That's just the way things were. And, uh, but you see, you read uh, Brother Adam's book, Beekeeping in Buckets Fast Savvy. I sell them. They go online to my website, webcloss.com, and uh, order one. It's amazing how well he did with these tiny little, basically a quarter of a hive. Uh, it was a big hive. It was a jumbo hive, but a quarter of a hive with, with providing the bees and the resources he needed. And he kept bees kept those loops going year-round. Um, one person's wondering if you sell the queens that, uh, that you raise. Uh, we are selling them, but only locally. We're just, uh, you have to drive to pick them up because we're not shipping yet. Uh, we are, uh, talk about uh, the Three Stooges. There are three of us involved, so you could draw your own conclusions right now. We're just not set up yet for anything of that size and so forth. And we've been experimenting using uh, virgin queens this year, and uh, for introduction, we've had mixed results on that. Uh, the first cycle seemed to be very good, and the last cycle seems to not have been as, as successful. So, um, jury's still out on that one. Uh, we are producing a few mated queens, but. Like all things, it takes time and a lot of work. So eventually, hopefully, we're going to have stuff to sell. Unless you live in the Kalamazoo area and want to drop in, call first. Um, <laughs> uh, you, you might have some people knocking on your door tomorrow. Um, 
I, I'm curious about if you're if you're setting up a, a nuke right now. Um, what do you think about? Uh, we've talked a lot about feeding and the importance of nutrition. What about any sort of medications? Would you would you medicate a nuke? I think I think that if you're going to medicate for anything, I would medicate for nosema, uh using fumagellin. Um, so far, we've been able to avoid all chemicals. Uh, you know, other than powdered sugar, because we're using powdered sugar for dusting uh, to, to sample for the mites. But the um, uh, fumagellin may be the exception, and, and we need to get some spore counts. And so if you've had a, a history of problems with uh, nosema, that's what I would medicate with in the fall, and it's, it's, it's just adjust the dosage to the size of the unit. Don't give them the dosage of a full-size colony. They'd probably choke on it. So that would be the only thing I would do. In terms of mite control, setting these nukes up that break in the brood cycle, the new queen, uh, rural mites would be less of an issue. Tracheal mites, if, you, if you've had a history with tracheal mite problems, then you may want to consider that. But I haven't talked to anybody with a tracheal mite pro problem for a long time. Any other disease, European fall brood, chalk brood, uh, any of these other diseases, if you have the problem, uh, this colony is out of the operation. You just uh, you have a plan for recycling the queen, uh, which usually means for me running into the hive tool real fast, or uh, some other plan. So you're not putting these bees with diseases in the winter. All right, uh, Larry. It's a it's a little bit after seven, so I want to be mindful of your time. Um, I appreciate you uh, joining us this evening. And uh, going over all this material, I think this is something that uh, that that well, I think nukes in general are are, are units of uh, uh, that are often overlooked in in beekeeping operations. Um, you know, I think people often uh, look to them as as something that the big commercial beekeepers do or that the sideliners do. But I think really uh, everyone uh, should be setting up. A nuke or two or maybe more uh, in their backyard in conjunction with their one or two colonies. Um, yeah, I think every, here, here's, here's, here's my pitch for you manufacturers is that every beginner's kit should include one nuke. <laughs> That's, uh, that, I'll, I'll take that under advisement too. That might be a tougher sell, um, but, uh, but I, I do think that, uh, that nukes are, are a critical part of any beekeeping operation, regardless of size, um, and, and I, I think, uh, well, I'm not sure where I heard this, but uh, you know, the, the prevailing thought is that you ought to have about 10 percent, 10 to 15 percent uh, of your colony numbers in new form. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so, so I really think that this is an important topic, and I really do appreciate you coming in, and, and this is a great way for people. To certainly reduce their costs by having to replace packages or buy replacement packages or buy nukes in the spring, and it and it, it lends to that sort of local um, dynamic of of raising queens or selecting for queens that are are local um, to the environment and therefore may be, do a little bit better and perform a little bit better for po for folks. Um, so so again, Larry, I just can't thank you enough for. For coming out here tonight, and I hope the folks that are uh, are listening in do go to uh, his website and uh, check out his selection of books. There, he's got quite a selection. Um, and Larry, thank you again. I, I appreciate it. And wh what what's the next one? What what, let's, what can we can we pigeonhole you again and get you to come back here again for something? What will be the next topic? Uh, what sounds good to you? <laughs> Well, we'll have to think about it. Uh, you know, you walked right into it so easily the last time. You're going to make me work for it oh, this it time. Logical, it was a logical segue last time. So it was. maybe we should just think about, you and I need to talk about maybe doing one in the winter, uh, early spring, and see how they're doing on these things, and get, get some feedback from the people that have listened to this. All right. Sounds good. Well, thank you again, Alrighty. and thank you, everyone, okay, thank for attending in. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll hope to see you at the next one. Sounds good. Thank you, Larry. Sure, I'm going to hang up and disconnect everything here. So that, have a good night. You too. Bye-bye.